Okay, so in this video, I'm going to teach you the most basic test of difference, that is the independent samples t-test. Uh, this video will showcase the contents of the test, um, not, some, not, uh, not examples. Uh, the example will be uh, given to the next video. But here, I'm going to dive into the content of the independent samples t-test, and um, I'm going to be very much in detail. Okay, so I hope you uh, sit back uh, and, you know, learn something from this one. So I'm going to give you an example of why we need to uh, learn this first. So we need to consider this bar graph. So this figure one shows the mean vocabulary scores for a sample of female and a sample of male high school seniors. So I'm going to I'm gonna pause for a while and uh, I have a question then for you. What, can you say that there's a difference between these two um, sets of scores in males and females. Okay. Well, at first glance, you may say that, yeah, there's a difference. Uh, it's really clear, right? Um, that in this case, females are higher than males. It's very clear. Um, females got 76.4 score and males have 75.6. You might say that, but in reality, you cannot conclude that female vocabulary scores are higher than males because recall that this data are, is taken or are taken from a sample of female and male scores. And we know that sample data vary upon the, the population data that they, that they that we are, that they're taken from. And that's the purpose of inferential statistics, to double check if we can conclude, given the minimum value of the sample that we have, can we conclude that this is also true for the population? Hence, the independent samples t-test. That's also the reason why there's the word significant in every objective that we have. Because if you just ask, like, is there a difference? Well, there will always be a difference. Um, the word significance say that is the difference not due to chance? Hence, that's why we ask, is there a significant difference between two variables? So the t-tests for independent samples are used to determine the differences in the means of two independent samples um, from the name itself. This test requires continuous dependent variables and uh, categorical independent variable. Um, this test then produces a t-score, which is a ratio of the differences between the groups and these are, this is the formula, um, not aligned, should be aligned. Uh, a large t-score indicates that there's a greater difference between the groups and a smaller t-score um, say that they're more, they're, they're, the more similarity is there between the groups. So for instance, if the t-score is five, that means that the groups are five times as different from each other as they are within each other. Um, this test, is most often used to analyze the results of three different uh, types of uh, study designs. One would be determining if there's a difference or there are differences between two independent groups. Two, determining if there are differences between interventions. And three, determining if there are differences in changes of scores. So what are the assumptions of independent samples t-test? Number one would be there should be a single dependent variable that is continuous, like time, exam performance, intelligence, weight, and so on. Number two, you should have one independent variable that consists of strictly two categorical independent groups. That is, it's dichotomous, like, for example, sex, male or female, employment status, employed, unemployed, and etc. The thing is, there should only be exactly two categories. Number three, you should have independence of observation. So that there is no uh, relationship between the observations. That's why it's called independent groups. Okay, there's no relationship between the participants either in either the groups. There should be no outliers as well. Outliers um, tend to uh, to give some errors when the, the test is run. Remember that you're comparing the means, and by the definition of the mean, it is sensitive to outliers. So what you do is uh, you need to, uh, what do you call that, delete the outliers first before running it, okay? 
Number five, the, the your dependent variable should be approximately normally distributed for each group of your independent variable. So uh, the thing is, the independent variable, independent sample t test is considered, considered to be robust to violations. Um, this means that for some violations of the assumption can be tolerated and the test will still provide valid results. This is um, usually, usually happens if your sample size is enough. So um, how can we say that in that the sample size is enough and that uh, the t test can tolerate uh, normality? That is when your n is equal to 128. Where did we get this 128? Um, you might ask. Uh, we use this using the power analysis, using G star power. Um, we set up the tail it to be two tailed, uh, our alpha level to be 0 0.05, and I set up the power to be 80%, which is the conventional acceptable power of the test. And the minimum sample size should be 128, that is 64 per categorical group. And that's where I got the 128 um, minimum sample size. And lastly, there should be homogeneity of variances or the variances should be almost equal or better if they're equal. So uh, samples, if sample sizes are quite different, the independent samples t-test is sensitive to this violation. That's why we use the Welch equivalent of this independent samples t-test. Okay, so you can rewind the video if you want to double check for the assumptions. Um, how do we check for the normality? Uh, especially if your sample size is not enough, we can use the Shapiro-Wilk normality test. But there are two others, the Kolmogorov-Smirnov and the Anderson-Darling. But the Shapiro-Wilk pr proves to be the most popular. Uh, and uh, in some researches, it's also the most powerful. But it depends on the on the literature you're, you're looking at. Some would say that it's the Kolmogorov-Smirnov, but uh, double check your literature depending on the dependent variable that you have. Um, how do we tell if it's if there's a violation in the assumption of normality? If the p-value of Shapirovic is less than 0 0.05 or less than your alpha level, it would say that there's a violation in the normality test. You may as well look at the QQ plot. The QQ plot or the quantile quantile plot shows uh, it's a visual, um, check if there is normality or there is a violation in normality though it's not an airtight proof because it's only a visual check but uh, you know it 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 pays to do, just to double check on your um normality and that's how you will double check how you will see if your data is normal levine's test is the one used to determine if there is homogeneity of variances or the test the variances of the populations are equal of the two uh, two categorical groups. Levine's test is one of those tests for homogeneity. We have the brown foresight, but Levine's is the one which is already, already, uh, readily available for softwares. And if the p-value is less than 0 0.05 or less than your alpha, there is a violation for the assumption of normality, and we'll be conducting or using the Welch equivalent of that test. Instead of students, we're going to make use of student, uh, Welch test. Now, to simplify the the procedure in applying t-test for independent samples, we're going to make use of this four-step procedure, which is pretty much clear. Um, number one, we state the null and alternative hypotheses, select the alpha level. Number two, select the test statistic or appropriate statistical tool. Um, we check the assumptions as well uh, for the parametric test that is, uh, most importantly, um, the characteristic of the data, continuous dependent variable. Uh, dichotomous independent variable, um, no significant outliers, what else? Independence of groups, normality, and homogeneity of variances. You should double check all of that. And then you run it with, with a statistical software and compute for the p-value. Number three is the decision rule. If the p-value is less than your alpha or 0 0.05 commonly, then we reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, we do not reject the null hypothesis. And um, that's how we decide whether to reject or not to reject the null hypothesis. And then lastly, of course, we need to make the conclusion based on the results that we had. So one example of the study group would be, say, if you measure uh, the salaries of two groups, like males and females, and wish to compare the dependent variable between these two groups, you can take the mean of the dependent variables in each group and use an independent sample t-test to compare them. So for example, a comparison between mean salary of males and females is one a particular example where independent samples t-test is most applied. So 
what are what is the setup of the null hypothesis as far as um, symbolic form is is uh, is used so the null hypothesis will be it can be set up like this the the means when you when you um deduct each of the mean mean 1 minus mean 2 it will be equal to 0 that means that they are equal because algebraically you can transpose this negative mu sub 2 to the other side it will be equal and you know um when will they be equal if the difference is 0 it makes sense so um these are two the three types of alternative hypotheses, a two-tailed and the one-tailed each. So you may pause the video to double check on that. And recall that the goal is to answer these kinds of research questions. Um, this setup is taken from experience and taken from the a common statement of the problem for uh, for college graduate theses. So t-test for independent samples uh, will calculate the p-value and it will give you the null hypothesis taken from the previous slides. If your p-value is less than or equal to your, al to your alpha or 0 0.05, we reject. If it's greater than 0 0.05, we do not reject the test. And remember, just a simple recall, you cannot accept the null hypothesis. Why? Can I refer you to the previous video? Uh, can you check on that? The introduction to uh, inferential statistics and try to look at the analogy on the courtroom by Walpole. It's a very beautiful analogy on why we cannot accept the null hypothesis. Afterwards, a convention nowadays is not only looking at the p-value, but looking at the effect size of the test. So what is an effect size? An effect size is a standard measure that can calculate that can be calculated from any number of statistical analysis. The, the, there is a limitation if we're going to make use of the p-value approach. It only evaluates the probability of obtaining the sample outcome by chance, but does not indicate how big the difference is, nor can it be compared across different studies. These, um, these things that the effect size can determine is pretty much useful um, because we can compare it with different studies. The effect size indicates the magnitude or the strength of the difference between the groups. So according to Cohen, 1988, these are the different or some common effect sizes shown below. And what are the different measures for, for uh, effect size? For this video, since we're only talking about t-test for independent samples, we will only limit ourselves or focus on Cohen's d, that is between means. So we have here... Uh, whatever the Cohen's d value, it indicates this amount or this uh, meaning. So it's small, it's medium, it is large. So just imagine it in intervals now. Um, 0 0.2 to 0, point, uh, 0. Less than 0 0.2, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, 0. Point, uh, sorry, 0 0.2 to 0 0.499, 0 0.5 to 0 0.799, 0 0.8 above. That's how you understand it. So... Reverse procedure for the p-value, um, we just update, we make the conclusion, and we must always input the effect size. So I'm going to show you an example in the next video. Uh, hopefully, you learned something here. If you, if there's a misunderstanding or something that, that is difficult to understand in this video, do rewind it and you know uh, listen and listen and again and again, and hopefully you can understand it. So we'll end here. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next.